I've been working in restaurants since I was 15 years old, but this happened when I was 28. I had just moved to a new city to pursue a long-distance relationship, and although my boyfriend could easily support us both, I took a job as a server. It was a steakhouse type of place that was part of a large chain. Part of what I liked about working in restaurants is that the people are always fun. We work hard, and that forms a kind of bond that I don't usually feel in other workplaces. But on my first day at the new place, I met some of my new co-workers. One of them was Sarah. Right from the beginning, we didn't get along. I'm not sure what her problem was, but she always seemed to have an issue with me. Sarah was about 10 years older than me, so probably in her late 30s. She was almost 6 feet tall and on the thicker side. Most people there were smokers, but Sarah was probably the worst of all of them. She had a strong smell coming off of her at all times, and it was off-putting. When I first met her, we shook hands and went about the workday. It was just a bad vibe that I got at first, but after my first week, we had a shift together again. It was a Saturday night, and a few of us were working until close. When we closed the place for the evening, Sarah invited the other two servers out for drinks, but tried to leave me out. One of the other girls invited me anyway. When we were hanging out, she made some comments to me that were really like backhanded compliments. After that, Sarah began talking behind my back, spreading rumors to our co-workers, and even the manager. I'd catch bits and pieces of what she was saying. She was telling people how lazy I was, and said that I didn't know what I was doing. She even told one of the other servers that I was screwing up orders on purpose. I knew she was lying, but it was hard to ignore when it felt like everyone else was starting to believe her. I had been to high school, so this wasn't new to me. I just never thought I would be dealing with drama like that in my late 20s. As the weeks went by, the situation with Sarah didn't improve. It got worse. She seemed to make it her mission to make my life hell. One day, I overheard her telling the manager that I had been rude to a customer, which wasn't true. The manager pulled me aside and gave me a warning, even though I tried to explain that it was a lie. I could see in his eyes that he wasn't convinced. It was frustrating, knowing that Sarah's lies were starting to stick. The stress of dealing with her started to wear on me. I'd lie awake at night, replaying the events of the day in my head, trying to figure out what I'd done to make her hate me so much. But no matter how much I thought about it, I couldn't come up with an answer, and I started to feel paranoid, constantly looking over my shoulder at work, waiting for the next thing she'd do to undermine me. Eventually, I reached my breaking point, after a particularly bad day, where Sarah made me look like an idiot in front of a full dining room, I decided I'd had enough. I handed in my notice the next morning, figuring it wasn't worth the headache anymore. I had discussed it with my boyfriend, and he encouraged me to try something else. I had some other ideas. There were some courses that I had my eye on, and I was thinking of becoming a physiotherapist anyway. After quitting, I felt relieved. No more dealing with those games. One night, I was out with my boyfriend and some friends when I saw Sarah sitting alone at the bar. She was staring straight at me. I hadn't seen her since I left the restaurant, and I had hoped I'd never have to see her again. She didn't approach me, but it was weird seeing her there. She was really eyeing us the whole time. The others at my table didn't know who she was, but I leaned over to my boyfriend and whispered that it was her. About an hour after I noticed her, I was still feeling uncomfortable. I would occasionally glance over to where Sarah was sitting, and as soon as we made eye contact, she would look away. I had had enough, so I suggested that we go somewhere else. Everyone was fine with it, so we paid the bill, then got up and left. Started walking to another bar, and we were on the street for about 15 minutes. At one point, I looked back and saw Sarah on the sidewalk behind us. That was when I was sure that she was following us. As soon as I noticed that, I whispered to my boyfriend that I wanted to go home. We got an Uber and called it a night early. Things got even worse after that night. I started getting strange texts from an unknown number. They were messages like, I saw you at the store today, or nice shirt you wore yesterday. Each time, they described exactly what I had been doing or wearing. It was unsettling, and my mind went right to Sarah. I told myself it could be a prank, maybe just someone messing with me, but deep down, I knew it was her. One evening, I came home to find a note taped to my door. It simply read, Miss you. I showed it to my boyfriend when he got home, and he called the cops before I was even finished talking. It's a good thing he did, because I would have never done it. Maybe I was scared, or maybe I was just in denial. I still don't know exactly what the police did, but she never bothered me again after that. I guess they just gave her a warning. 
Whatever they did, it worked. I'm 33 and I live in Michigan. I grew up in a military family, which means we traveled an awful lot. When I was 22, I came out to my parents and I knew it was going to be a fiasco. They were always hyper-religious folks and they would do things like donate money to televangelists because they believed they were helping the cause. As I expected, it didn't go well. My parents gave me two weeks to pack my things and move out. I saw that as a twisted kind of grace because they were honestly ready just to throw my things out on the street and disown me on the spot. About a week and a half into my impending exile, I got lucky and a friend of mine stood up for me, to the best of their abilities anyway. They didn't change my parents' minds, but they let me know that they converted their attic into a guest bedroom. They said that I could rent it until I got back on my feet. Because of that, I thankfully didn't have to worry about being homeless. I know a few of you are wondering why a 22-year-old guy was still living with his parents. To be blunt, I was doing my bachelor's in small business management while working a part-time job at a convenience store with odd hours. It was honestly just easier. But deep down, I hated that sensation of having to tiptoe around who I really was. Do I wish I'd waited until I'd moved out to break the news to them? No, not really. It would have gone the same exact way. I was their only child, and they wanted biological grandchildren. Now that they weren't getting what they wanted, which was pretty much what they were all about, I was no good to them anymore. Thanks to all the stress involved with the situation, I ended up flunking out of college. Granted, I had a roof over my head, but the two people that gave me life no longer wanted me in theirs, and it screwed with me for the longest time. I picked up more hours at the convenience store, but ended up leaving after the place got robbed. From there, I would get an unpleasant job at a sports bar in the area. I was learning how to be their bartender, and eventually became one of their most consistent and reliable ones. However, they made no bones about the fact that I was a diversity hire. To this day, I think I'm the only gay person they've ever had on their payroll. The owner was the very definition of a douche canoe. A married man with three kids, but always hitting on the younger female staff. He catered to the big spenders no matter how belligerent they got. And the icing on the cake? He had this little running joke that only he found funny. If he were bending over to pick something up, and he knew I was within the vicinity, he would stand up quickly and clasp both of his butt cheeks together as hard as possible. He was grasping them like he was in a prison movie, and he had just dropped the soap. Did anybody stand up for me at that job? Absolutely not. He had everybody under his thumb. If anybody questioned his authority, they were either fired or had their hours dramatically decreased. If I were to go and report him, it would be my word against theirs, and everybody was too afraid to go against that jackass. That's why I rolled with the proverbial punches for about eight months. He did everything in his power to make me quit during the first two. However, once he realized that I was there for however long I felt I wanted to be there, he gave up the ghost. I was thankful for my friend's kindness, and I wanted to do my best to pull my weight. Sure, my paychecks were always low, and I relied heavily on tips, but it was usually enough to give him a fair amount towards the groceries, or whatever utility bill happened to pop up at the time. My last night on the job happened as a result of me losing my temper and getting fired. Ultimately, my old boss won by playing the long game. My friend made it a point to mention that anybody could be a creep. If you've ever worked in retail, the food service industry, been a bartender, or worked with the public in general, then you know how true this is. To me, the absolute worst thing was 50-something-year-old bleach blonde soccer moms who had one too many mimosas and decided I was cute. Normally, they would just hit on me to the point where I would fake feeling flattered, then tell them, Sorry, sweetie, you're barking up the wrong tree. Then they would leave it at that. No harm, no foul. This night started out with the same old song and dance, but this particular woman wouldn't take no for an answer. She was exactly how you would picture a soccer mom, then she had that bleach blonde haircut that screamed, I want to speak to your manager. She had a badly done spray tan and makeup caked on so thick that you would think she fell face first on a Revlon loaded Claymore mine. She was ordering margaritas like it was her life's purpose. She was four drinks in when she told one of the waitresses that there was a problem with one of them. She claimed I watered down her drink. Mind you, she was pretty snockered at this point, heavily slurring her speech. The few friends that were with her were no better. She demanded to speak to the bartender, and at that point, I was obligated to go over there and find out why she thought I did that. As I made it to the table, she was saying something to her friends, and they were chuckling amongst themselves. 
before I could get a word out, she grabbed my crotch. I jumped back and screamed out, Hey lady, what the hell are you thinking? She smiled at me, and I watched her eyes start to roll up in the back of her head. Then she said, I'm thinking you should go home with me tonight. I freaked out. This woman just assaulted me, and unfortunately, very few people would take me seriously for obvious reasons. Or at least that's what I thought at the time. I was flat out freaking out on this woman when my boss came over just in time to hear me call her an effing cow. He just stood there for a minute, said nothing, went back to the register and took a look at the tab they rang up. He saw these women had spent close to $300 on drinks in the short time they'd been there. He walked over to me and told me to remove my name tag. Go home, don't come back, you're not needed here anymore, is what he told me so the women didn't get up and leave. I got back to my little apartment and my friend showed up from his late night shift at Walmart not too long afterwards. As I was telling him everything that transpired that night, he tried to convince me to file a wrongful termination suit against my boss and an assault charge against the woman. There were two glaring problems though, at that particular time in my life, I could not afford any kind of legal defense, so a lawyer was out of the question. Secondly, the only way I would have known what that woman's name was, is if I had stuck around long enough to process her credit card. I didn't have that information, so the crotch grabbing soccer mom got away scot free. I was angry, livid even. In a situation where I should have been able to get justice, I was absolutely backed into a corner and knew it wouldn't happen. As jilted as I was, I knew I had to find a job soon. Again, I'm not a leech, and I didn't want to put my friend in a situation where he had to struggle financially due to my lack of a job. And then one night, his friend Anthony came over. One thing you guys should know about Anthony is that he is a die-hard juggalo. However, he doesn't live up to a single one of the stereotypes most people have been led to believe. He doesn't bathe in Fago, doesn't treat people like crap, and he doesn't fight unless he absolutely has to. Occasionally he gets bored and breaks out the face paint, but that's about as close to stereotypical as he gets. I found out that my friend had told him a lot about me. At first I was feeling a bit annoyed, because that's kind of a big no-no, I'm a pretty private person. But before I could continue being angry and speak my mind, Anthony diffused the situation by saying, Hey Martin, I heard you went through it with your parents after coming out. It sucks, that should never happen to any kid. My 16-year-old brother almost went through the same thing with my parents about a year back, but I was at least able to talk sense into them. I just want you to know, if you ever feel like venting or just want somebody to talk to, I'm here for you, dude. I hadn't even spoken a word to Anthony, and yet there he was, showing me the type of character I lived for. He's a stand-up guy and one of my best friends to this day. The three of us all sat down and had some beers. Then we started chatting about everyday life, and I just blurted out what happened at the bar right up until my termination. That was when he told me about the nightclub where I'm currently employed to this day. I decided that I wanted to see what it was all about, and ended up going while they were having a drag show one night. I sat at the bar and ordered a rum and coke before chatting it up with the bartender. He told me that I looked familiar, then he remembered me from the sports bar. It turned out it was his dad's favorite place to go every now and again and he was usually his father's designated driver. I didn't even realize that we had spoken on multiple occasions. Then I told him what happened at my previous job, and I could see that he was visibly upset. He leaned over the bar, patted me on the shoulder, and told me they were actually looking for a weekend bartender. I gave him my information, and within a couple of days I was called in for an interview. The rest is history. A bar, no matter what the theme or clientele, is still a bar. I will say that throughout the years, I've had a handful of experiences that were crazy, but nowhere near as severe. I've never once thought that I needed to leave this place after an incident. It's kind of amazing what having a boss that actually cares about his employees does for you in terms of morale. Recently, I decided to pursue my degree once again through online classes. My boss was a bit saddened to learn that I was attempting to move on, but a bartender's salary in this day and age is just barely enough to survive, let alone live. I ended up moving out from my friend's place about five years back, and I'm doing okay on my own. I'm happily single and not pursuing anything while I get my affairs in order. Eventually, I would like to move away from Michigan altogether. Of course, I would still maintain contact with my friends, but I've had my heart set on Seattle since 2022. So once I get my shit straight, I'll be doing my best to be a stone's throw away from the Space Needle. I may share some more of my stories in the future. It depends on how comfortable I feel. 
You'll notice that I didn't name the sports bar, or my previous boss's name. That's largely due to the fact that he's a true crime podcast addict. I used to occasionally catch him listening to some of the related channels on YouTube while he was working on paperwork in his office. I just don't want to risk anything, because a few of my old co-workers know where I currently work. Considering that one of them is his daughter, and she's of a like mindset, I wouldn't put it past her to go running back to him with that information, should he incidentally come across me telling my story. All the best folks, treat yourself and others well. Life is too short for the BS we put each other through. Let's try to make each day better than the last for ourselves and others. In my senior year of high school, I had a habit of sneaking out late at night. My parents never suspected it, and I was careful not to get caught. We lived in a quiet suburb, and most of my good friends were not far away. Dan and Eric were two of the guys that I hung out with the most. We had been friends since elementary school, so we were pretty close. Dan was a quiet kid who was one of the smartest guys in our school. Because of that, he had developed a reputation for being a nerd, a reputation that he hated. Dan would try to shake that image by doing some rebellious things like smoking or drinking, but I always thought it seemed forced. One Thursday afternoon, the three of us were walking home from the bus stop, and Dan said that he had stolen some beers from his dad's fridge in the basement. I told him that we couldn't have them at my place because my parents would be around. Eric said the same. That night the guys came over anyway, and we just hung around playing some games and talking. When they were about to go, Dan suggested that we sneak out after dark and have the beers outside somewhere. We all agreed. At around one in the morning, when my parents were asleep, I tiptoed down the stairs and snuck out the back door. Dan and Eric were waiting by the intersection where we would always meet. We lived on a quiet street where everything was mostly houses, but there was one street with a few businesses. That night, we decided to hang out near that area. It was about a 15 minute walk, and the whole way there, we didn't see another person or car. It was dead quiet. We wandered past the closed down shops until we found an empty parking lot. It belonged to a restaurant that we would go to sometimes, but it closed really early, so we knew that nobody would be there. The restaurant was called Darcy's, and we would go there with our family sometimes. It was kind of fancy, so it was more of a once or twice a year treat. There was a dark corner on the far end of the lot, and we figured it was as good a place as any to sit down. We settled on the curb and started talking quietly. Dan put his backpack down, and I heard the glass bottles of beer clink together. Then Dan unzipped the bag and handed one to me, then one to Eric. I didn't like the taste of beer, but I forced it to look cool for my friends. After half an hour, we were still talking and having a good time. It felt like we had the whole town to ourselves. But after a while, I noticed something in the distance. There was a dark shadow moving towards us. At first I couldn't make out any details, and none of us said anything as we watched it get closer. He passed by a street light that was about 50 feet away. That was when I was sure that it was a man. He was probably around 40 years old, but he was dressed in a way that made him seem much younger. He wore a hoodie and jeans that looked like something a teenager might wear. It was like he was trying too hard to blend in with kids our age, but he didn't quite pull it off. When he got to us, he introduced himself as Hans. His voice was friendly enough, but there was something off about him that made me uneasy. He didn't seem like he was up to anything specific, just hanging around, asking us what we were up to, and making small talk. We answered him in short sentences, not really wanting to engage, but also not wanting to be rude. It was a strange situation, and I was definitely put off by him. We were still sitting on the curb, and Hans was standing in front of us. Our beers were still out, and he must have seen them. I was a little concerned that we would get in trouble, but he didn't say anything. Hans didn't leave though, he just lingered there trying to make casual conversation. The longer he stayed, the more uncomfortable I felt. I glanced at Dan and Eric, but they didn't seem too concerned, at least not yet. But then, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something else, a couple of other figures in the distance. They were just barely visible, lingering near the edge of the parking lot, but they weren't moving closer. I couldn't make out any details about them, just that they were there, watching. My gut told me something was wrong. I nudged Eric, trying to be subtle about it, and gave him a look that said we should leave. He glanced over, then at Hans, and nodded slightly. I could tell Dan was starting to pick up on the weirdness too. I then handed my bottle to Dan, and he put it in his bag. 
Hans seemed to notice, then he looked at me and laughed slightly, then he took a step closer. By then, he was standing directly over me, uncomfortably close. I had to jerk my head up to look at him, and when I did, I was looking right up his nose. I shifted over a few spots, then cleared my throat and made up an excuse about needing to head home. Dan and Eric backed me up, and we all got up to leave. Hans didn't try to stop us, but he didn't leave either. He just stood there, watching us walk away. As we crossed the street, I looked back. Hans still hadn't moved, and the other two had started moving towards him. We didn't stick around to see what happened next. We kept walking, picking up the pace once we were out of sight. No one said anything for a while, but we all felt creeped out. None of us looked back again. We just wanted to get as far away from that parking lot as possible. When we finally reached Dan's place, I let out a breath that I didn't realize I was holding. Eric broke the silence first, saying how weird that whole thing had been. We all agreed, but we didn't dwell on it too much. It was late, and we were tired. I headed home, sneaking back into my house without any trouble. I made it into my room without waking up my parents, and when I collapsed onto my bed, I felt relieved. The next day at school, I met up with the guys for lunch. As soon as I saw Dan, he told us that there had been a break-in the night before. I was surprised because that was pretty rare where we lived. But what really shook me was when he told me exactly where it was. Dan told us that it was the restaurant that was robbed, the one where we were hanging out the night before. I immediately thought of Hans and the other men we saw out there, and I'm sure the others did too. Me and the guys discussed what to do that day over lunch. I wanted to tell what we saw, but Dan was worried that we would get in trouble for sneaking out. When it came down to it, I told him that I was reporting it, but that he could do whatever he wanted. I ended up telling my parents that night. They called the cops for me and didn't seem to care that I snuck out. Even though we told the cops what we knew, the robbers were never caught. If there's any silver lining, it's that Dan never got in trouble either. This happened just last month when I was at work. I'd gotten a job at a fast food place near my school. They always put me on the night shift, which I usually didn't mind. I was usually paired up with Shayna, who was a middle-aged woman that I got along with well. She was kind of like the night manager, and she was pretty laid back. However, when this happened, Shayna had called in sick, leaving me alone for the evening. It was one of those nights where time seemed to go slower than usual. It was nine at night, and I had been there by seven, but I could have sworn that I was there all day. It wasn't busy at all. If anything, that might have helped the time go by. I was basically alone in that restaurant the whole time, with just a few customers to keep me company. At around 9pm, a man walked in. He looked like he hadn't showered in days, with tangled hair and dirty clothes. That being said, the guy was huge. He was at least 6 foot 2, and probably 300 pounds or more. He looked strong, and that was kind of intimidating. A few other customers were there, so I didn't think much of it though. He didn't make any trouble initially just sat at a table, staring off into space. I kept an eye on him, but figured it wasn't worth confronting him or asking him to leave. The place was quiet, and he didn't seem to be bothering anyone. He stayed for over an hour and didn't order anything. When he finally left, I was a little relieved because I wouldn't have to deal with it. At around 11, most of the other customers had left, and the restaurant was nearly empty. There was just a small group of guys at the far end. Then the man from before walked back in. He didn't say anything or even look at me. He just went to one of the booths near the bathroom and sat down. He buried his head in his arms and it almost seemed like he was going to sleep. It was getting late and with only a half hour left until closing, I decided it was time to ask him to leave. I wanted to do it while there were still some other customers there, just in case. I walked over and told him the restaurant was closing soon and that he needed to go. He sat up and looked at me but didn't say anything. I told him again, and then he started to get agitated. His face turned red, and he stood up, and he began yelling at me. His voice was loud and harsh, making my head hurt. The smell of his breath was overpowering, and made me gag a little. I stepped back, but he moved closer, shouting right in my face. I know I should have gotten away from him, but I was kind of frozen with shock. Then he began slamming his hands down on the table. It was so hard that one of the salt shakers tipped over. I could see the other group of guys at the far table glancing over, but they didn't seem to want to get involved. I can't say I blame them, but I would have appreciated some help. 
Eventually, I got away and went back behind the counter to get my phone and call the police. As soon as I got it out of my bag, I looked up and the man had gone out the front door. I decided not to call the police because it didn't seem worth it. I think he probably should have been arrested for getting in my face and everything, but I really just wanted to go home and not have to deal with the hassle. I was relieved that he was finally gone though. The remaining group of guys at the far table had left too, but I didn't even see them go. The restaurant was completely empty, which was a good thing since we were closing soon. I had finished all the cleaning and other closing related things about 10 minutes early, so I was just standing behind the counter waiting. The glass walls of the building were dark black in the night. Without any outdoor lights nearby, it was like looking at a mirror you couldn't see out at all. Suddenly, I heard a loud crash in the main dining room. The sound came from the side of the building that I couldn't quite see from where I was standing. I saw glass shards scattered on the ground though, so I knew one of the windows was smashed. I didn't know for sure, but my first thought was that it was the angry man from before. I went to the back exit, moving as fast as I could without drawing attention. I still didn't know if he was coming for me, so I wanted to get out fast. I tiptoed through the back hallway to the exit, and when I got there, I opened the back door. After stepping out into the alley, I shut the door softly, then headed to my car. I started it up and drove around the corner of the building. I noticed a smashed window as I went, but it was too dark in the parking lot to see much of anything. I took a quick look in the building, but couldn't see much in there either. I then turned my car around and drove down the street. Once I was a safe distance away, I pulled over and called the police. They arrived within a few minutes, and I drove back over to the restaurant. We went over to the window, and I finally got a good look inside. It was one of the heavy steel garbage cans that were kept outside near the exit. I never thought a person could lift one of those, let alone throw it through a window. I was only back on the scene for a few minutes when the cops said that I could go. They said that they would secure the scene and get in touch with my boss. I was eventually called back to give some more details on the man who I thought had done the assault. He hasn't been caught yet, but like I said, it's only been a month. I just hope he doesn't come in again.